Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, welcome to the lecture series on the introduction of science fiction studies. Last lecture, you have been familiar, you have been made familiar with a fantastic concept called utopia, science fiction utopias. In this lecture, we are going to look at the opposite side of utopia. Although binary constructs are very redundant nowadays, but this kind of literature that is science fiction dystopia is the future kind of literature that we are talking about. In most of the superhero movies that you come across, the society is withering, everything is being destroyed by evil forces within the society. People are trying to get possession of as much property as possible and by exploiting other people. So that kind of society is completely unacceptable and is a totalitarian society. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss science fiction and dystopias. Dystopia is a genre or genre in itself, yet there are fantastic elements of science fiction present in that genre. Let us first consider the term dystopia. In the previous lecture on utopia, we have discussed that yo means good and topia means place. It's a Greek coinage and the first one, first person to talk about utopia was Sir Thomas More. In More's utopia, we find a society which is very accepting. Everybody has rights, everybody has a shared common goal of doing common good, but in a dystopian society, the opposite thing happens. So, dystopia is the opposite of utopia. This particular idea of a society is where humans are denigrated, dehumanized, they are suffering, their rights are all suspended. We will learn about all of these things in this particular lecture. So first let us consider the definition of dystopia according to the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. An imagined world or society in which people lead wretched, emphasis, dehumanized, fearful lives. Can you imagine a situation or a life where you are almost, we all are almost every moment living in fear? Fear that somebody will come and ask us that where have you spent your money, what are you doing your education, actually that is the reality. Some relative will come and ask, what are you going to do after your 12th, what are you going to do after you graduate, that is another thing. But fear is something when somebody comes and uh, challenges your existence that you cannot be living here, you have to move to another place. All the decisions that you have taken in your life will be questioned, each and everything you have to account for. And if it does not go by the rules that the government or the entire organization is prescribing, then you are in trouble. You will be incarcerated in prison. You will be placed under uh, surveillance. We will talk about this more in details. The 1930s saw the publication of a series of dystopias where the working of states, states, this is not like West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Kashmir. This is not the state. State is an idea, idea of a government. That is the meaning of the word state over here. We cannot see a state. It is not a geographical boundary. It is the entire country, the government, the people who are working for the government, the entire apparatus, the entire organism which controls a country. That is the idea of state. And it has, of course, uh, limitations. A state cannot function outside the geographical boundary that is uh, there. So, working of states was imagined which exploited the demand for orthodoxy to erase 
individuality. In our country, in India, we take India as an example. All of us are given individual rights. We have right to freedom, we have right to equality, we have right to opportunities, we have uh, right to education, right to proper health facilities. All these are the rights given to Indian citizen. However, in a diastopic world, these rights are completely suspended. You will not have these rights. You cannot go and say that I need basic education. Now in India, we have the um, uh, girl uh, education policies enforced by the government that the girl child should be sent to school. This is the right of the girl child. But in a diastopic society, there will be no such rights. The negative consequences. Okay, let me come back to the previous point once again. So, every uh, individuality will be erased. There will be no concept of individuality. There will only be the concept of state. The state has all the power. We as individuals cannot select, we cannot vote. The entire system of voting will be suspended. There will be no voting. There will be no democracy. Only whatever the rule of the king or the dictator will be, that we will have to follow. This idea is given by David Seed, which uh, about whom I uh, mention in almost every lecture because this book, a very short introduction to science fiction is perfect for the beginners. If you want to be introduced to the entire genre and sub-genre of science fiction, you ought to go through this book. Then the negative consequences of societal trends, technology and political systems. Technology, we will focus on this word technology. Can you name just for now that you are uh, the moment here that you are listening to my lecture, can you name a technological development in this society which has negative connotations? I am sure you must have heard of the uh, game called Blue Whale. It was very popular two, three years back when teenagers were forced to play this game and uh, they were threatened that if you don't play this game, then you will be uh, losing your family members, your uh, relatives will be killed and uh, that game made teenagers to commit suicide. So it is an online game. Can you imagine the negative influence that uh, internet has on people if it is not properly utilized? So technology, one hand is the addiction to internet, is the addiction to Instagram. Every day we are uh, wasting at least four to five hours just scrolling the reels. We are trying to scrolling the reels, we are trying to create a kind of atmosphere around us, a social, a virtual society around us and make ourselves feel comfortable that we are not alone. But in fact, we are lying on a sofa, we are lying on a bed, we are lying uh, just wherever we are sitting over there alone. And we are thinking, oh, I have 4,000 friends on my Facebook account. I have 5,000 followers in my Instagram account. Can you believe the idea of false um, uh, togetherness that these kind of apps are putting inside our brains? So the negative consequences, there is a list. There can be a very, very big list. But of course, there are positive consequences too. So instead of Going on with the negative consequences, we must focus on the positive consequences and encourage those parts of the internet and technological advancement of the society to move ahead. But in diastopic literature, this is exactly what happens. A child get addic gets addicted to internet. If the internet facilities are suspended in the household, ch uh, the child goes on a rampage and uh, destroys all the uh, household items. And let me tell you, this is not a story. You can just Google uh, this very thing and you will find a video of a crying mother, a sobbing mother who is showing the house that because I did not give my uh, child the mobile phone, he destroyed my entire house. 
So, this is what the negative consequences of technology mean. Then we have totalitarianism, loss of individual freedoms and dehumanization of humanity. First we will take word by word, totalitarianism, what do we mean by totalitarianism? If we go to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, you will find that the political concept that the citizen should be totally subject to an absolute state authority. That means there will be only one person taking decisions for everybody. I don't want my children to become uh, factory workers, but the state has given the order that all the children should work in the factory. What shall I do? I have no option. If I have to live in the state, if I have to live in my house, I will have to send my children to the factory. So there is absolutely zero communication with uh, zero two-way communication. That is, the order is given, the response is taken and the order is revised. No, there is only one point of communication, one direction of communication that you have to do it. That is the only, it is an order driven society. So totalitarianism is that kind of state we are talking about. Next loss of individual freedom. We discussed this when we were discussing erasing of individuality. When the individual freedom is lost, suppose I want to uh, visit Kailash, but Kailash is in a different, in a very controversial place and I am not allowed to visit Kailash. It is a uh, scenic beauty, the mountains, uh, even suppose I want to visit the Nicobar Islands, but I am not allowed to visit the Nicobar Islands because the tribes there need their peace and they cannot be interfered with. These are, let me tell you, very actual facts that Kailash is, uh, you have to obtain a, a, a written kind of document. Uh, they will uh, go and check your background and only then you can uh, go to Kailash because it is crossing state boundaries and everything. Consider this happening to everywhere you go, everywhere. You cannot go to the neighboring state, you cannot go to Uttaranchal, you cannot go to Gujarat, you cannot go to Punjab, you cannot go to Madhya Pradesh. Everywhere you want to go, first you will have to get a written permit from the state that you are leaving your house and you are going to that place. You will also have to state why are you going to that place? Can you imagine the kind of surveillance? Can you imagine the kind of restriction that is on an individual? Do you think that uh, one will go through all the paperwork just to go to a place uh, to enjoy a vacation or a holiday? No. That person will then say that, okay, forget it. There is a long process. I don't want to go. So. In order to avoid that long process, the person is getting sort of condition to stay inside the home, to stay inside the facility, whatever uh, community they are, are and therefore the state has ultimate authority. There will be no unpredictable situations. So that is a very uh, disturbing truth. Then dehumanization of humanity. This is a real fact that I am telling you. Uh, maybe 10-15 years back, there was a news article, um, if you go and you can check up uh, on the internet, you will find it. A person was having a heart attack uh, in middle of the street. I think probably it happened in Kolkata. In middle of the street, the person was having a heart attack and he was lying on the street asking for help. And somebody recorded that. The passers-by, the people were just going right beside him, just walking by him without even paying attention to what the person is suffering. Because nobody wants to get a police case, nobody wants to take the medical, uh, what should I say, duties. Nobody wants to take the uh, medical responsibilities of the person. You take the person to the hospital, the first thing they will say, you have to pay for this, you have to pay for that, you have to write your address, you have to write your name, you have to call the police. Nobody wants to do that. 
and this is just the beginning this is reality this has already happened and if it could happen 15 years back with the rise of the population with the increase of the population these cases are not going to go down the numbers are going to rise so there will be absolute dehumanization you will not be human at all the basic human ex instinct is to go and help another fellow human being but you're not doing it because you know there is a lot of paperwork you know there is a lot of um, responsibilities who is going to take that i have my own work i have my own tension in my home my job my this my that all the things cover your mind cloud your judgment and make you less of a human being so that is a reality we are living in so it is not very far from now suspension of right to one's own body we have right to body our own body that is called habeas corpus right to our own body it's a legal term but once we are under this kind of society diastopic society we don't have right to our own body the state if wills can take our body can take our organs the state needs a lung okay that person yes that person is going to donate a lung can you imagine you don't have a say in your um, uh, on the subject matter of your own body see so these are the situations that uh, we face in diastopic societies now here is a brief outline of the characteristics of diastopian societies oppressive government we just discussed this fact that what is oppression when the government is forcibly i will write this word forcibly applying force and telling us what to do the government is oppressing us if we want to say that no this time we need this kind of um, uh, vegetable prices we need uh, a very sustainable development we need uh, prices of the rice to be lowered because not everybody can afford that kind of money to buy basic food basic amenities we are telling the government please help us but the government is like no go and eat grass this was also a reality let me tell you uh, that is why the french revolution took place the french revolution the government was completely oppressive the kings said uh, when the uh, feudal lords uh, reported to the kings that the uh, peasants the farmers they did not have enough money to uh, clear the debt or even to buy food the king said oh they cannot buy food okay let them go and eat cake so the king had no idea that cake is also something which is baked and uh, it is a part of the food so for a king cake is uh, uh, freely available so the oppression and that is why louis 16 uh, that is the king who said all those things louis 16 was dragged from his bedroom and gelotined gelotin means the head was cut off by people who rose in revolution all the peasants farmers and the working class they gathered together and rose in revolution against such kind of dictatorship so oppressive government authoritarian regimes that exert complete control over citizens lives we just discussed this enough surveillance state surveillance is a very powerful word what does it mean surveillance surveillance is somebody is watching you all the time can you imagine you're going to a bank there is a camera over there there's a cctv which is looking at you you're going to the school there is a cctv in the school you are taking the school bus there is a cctv in the school bus you are in your home there is a cctv in your home the only places there are no cctvs are the toilets the washrooms till now there are no cctvs who knows uh, for the future so everywhere you go there will be a sign nowadays it is more frequent even to a, a shopping complex even to a stationery everywhere there will be a sign you are under observation you are being watched by a cctv camera somewhere they try to make the sign very uh, happy so they make smile you are under camera this is the slogan they put up but that means 
all of your movements are being watched. Do you think that you're sitting somewhere and uh, scrolling through your phone, nobody is watching you? You are absolutely wrong. The algorithm behind all the apps, algorithm is the coding process behind all the apps. They are watching you all the time. They are watching what do you select. They are watching what you don't select and thereby they are creating your profile. Once they have created your profile, they will sell their profile, your profile to companies and the companies will send targeted ads. That is someday you are thinking that, oh, let me Google. Uh, what is the cost of a TV screen 54 inches? The next day in your mobile phone, you see ads, TV screen, uh, flat TV, round TV, spherical TV, all sorts of TVs come uh, in your ads. You can also find TV 54 inches, 45 inches, all of these options are coming in your Google ads. Why? Because you have entered the data and they are watching you. Okay. So surveillance state, widespread surveillance and lack of privacy for the populace. There is no privacy. If I think that I am going to share a private moment with my family members in a small restaurant, there will be a camera at the corner watching you. It is not that they are infringing your rights. They will give the or the owner of the restaurant will tell you that this is for your security. Suppose somebody steals your purse, we will go and see in the CCTV camera who has stolen your purse. We will identify the thief and thereby we will just um, be able to recover your purse. So it is very, um, very uh, intriguing a concept, very interesting a concept that the thing that is supposed to help us is actually also building our profile and trying to manipulate the entire advertisements towards us, make us buy products, thereby boosting capitalism. Manipulation of information to maintain power and conformity. The word conformity means that you have to acknowledge that you confirm to this idea that you believe in this idea. Now I will give you the example of an idea. Many of the people in India today have the idea that if we study engineering we are going to land a wonderful very lucrative job which pays in lakhs per month. So that idea drives most of the parents to force their children to study engineering that your future will be secured. This idea and all the people who believe in this idea is confirming to the idea that yes, yes, you are right. Once we study engineering, we are going to be very rich. So engineering study is not about research or development. It is just to make ourselves full of money. So once a person Suppose a parent is trying to convince his uh, or her child that you must study engineering. This is the safest option. But the child says, no, I want to study something different. I want to be a musician. The moment you say that, you are deviating from that idea. And you will be treated, oh, you are deviating for, from the idea. You are a bad person. You should, I, I will uh, throw you out of my house. So conformity is very necessary for the state to hold power over people. Devaluation of human life and individuality, we have talked about it. Society prioritizes efficiency over personal well-being. Efficiency is more important. If the society wants you to work seven hours a day and you are not able to deliver the thing that the society expects you, the government expects you to deliver, then they will say, okay, instead of seven hours, now you are going to work for eight hours. If you are not able to do that work in eight hours, then they will ask you to go and work for 10 hours. But efficiency, efficiency is more important over personal well-being. The government, the company, the organization is not going to care if you are losing your mind. They will not care if you are just on the verge of mental breakdown. What will happen is that they will push you to do more and more work so that you can deliver as much as they are paying you. 
social classes and hierarchies restrict upward mobility social classes and hierarchies in our country we find that people who are not from the higher classes they have reservations they are given privileges they are given monetary support they are given social support there are multiple government schemes to help the backward classes but suppose there is a society who does not do any of those whoever is backward will remain backward forever and whoever has the higher the upper hand the higher hand will always prosper so that kind of society is again a dystopian society dystopias often depict a degraded environment due to neglect or exploitation so the environment it can be the physical environment around us physical or natural environment around us or it can be the work environment around us so in both the cases there is a neglect nobody cares in what condition you are working or nobody cares what is the natural uh, surrounding what is the natural environment where the if the air is breathable if the water is drinkable i'll tell you what kind of environment we have around us i'm sure during diwali you might have heard that so many crackers go up that the um, air becomes very bad for the lungs in bangalore in uh, chennai in uh, delhi it uh, the air is so much full of smoke and dust that it is not breathable and again also in workplaces you will find that those organizations who do not care about the condition of uh, in which the workers are working say say for example factories whose owners don't care the the walls are moist the uh, instruments are leaking there is always a chance of electric short circuit but still the workers are forced to work in that kind of environment so this is not a dystopian society we are talking about we are talk talking about now present situations advanced technologies are weaponized or used for control further oppressing the population so advanced technologies are uh, used to are weaponized see this word we now have a hold over the genetic engineering concept we can engineer we can clone uh, living creatures this is not used to help people these are being used to clone uh, bacteria viruses deadly viruses which are being used for bio warfares you don't want to uh, waste your soldiers so you just release a virus or a bacteria there are many example of zombie movies which are floating in the otts that is online platforms where you will find this kind of um actions taken by governments in order to suppress a uh, area's population we will take now very quick example of some of the science fiction dystopias which are very famous by the way 1984 by george orwell a classic depicting a totalitarian regime led by big brother so big brother is the top power over here under his rule everything is happening erasing individuality and independent thought so you cannot have a thought of your own people will be there watching you all the time watching what are you thinking even in today's life even now you are sitting in front of me right now you're looking at the camera and thinking oh i don't want to study i just want to go and have some golgappe but you cannot have the golgappe but you have the right to think about it isn't it you have the right to think about having a nice cream going for a stroll all of these things are in your head you have uh, the instinct that oh please i want to scroll my instagram account you can do that but suppose there is a person who is always right behind you seeing watching what you are thinking how about that what kind of reality you will be living in then brave new world 1932 by aldous huxley a future society controlled by pleasure conditioning suppression of individual emotions so in this particular world that huxley creates there is no place for emotions only logic so emotions is seen as a weakness 
which is again very um, challenging, very contradictory to what the current society believes. Earlier it was intelligent quotient IQ who which uh, everybody was running after. Then it transformed to um, EQ, emotional quotient. Now everybody looks for EQ in people. After that now we have SQ, social quotient. Are you well, um, are you well, uh, are you well prepared to meet the society? Are you able to carry yourself in the society? You might have a very good IQ, you might have a very good EQ, but you could have zero SQ which makes you a very bad person really. So SQ is uh, very important in today's world. So emotions are suspended in this brave new world. We will be reading about these two in details in a, a short time. The Hunger Games Triology. Triology means three books in a row. So from 2008 to 2010, they were published by um, Suzanne Collins. A post-apocalyptic world where a totalitarian regime forces children to fight to death for entertainment. So this is again a concept that many TV series have taken up. They uh, produce this idea in front of the viewers that the children are fighting amongst themselves. The viewers who are in a faraway land, they are placing their bets that this person is going to win, this person is going to die. The sick entertainment that they achieve from this, that is the Hunger Games. And for this, they are giving all sorts of scientific equipments uh, to the children. Fahrenheit 4 for 51, published in 1953 by Ray Bradbury. It is not uh, very accurately a scientific, um, a science fiction dystopia, but it is a part of the dystopian genre. Very important work because it discusses the importance of books, discusses the importance of literature. Set in a society where books are banned and firemen burn any remaining copies. It explores themes of censorship, knowledge suppression and the power of literature. A Clockwork Orange, let me tell you, uh, Anthony Burgess was very much influenced by Aldous Huxley and George Orwell. Both of these writers, they were uh, influential during their age. They have influenced a whole generation of dystopic literature. So Anthony Burgess was uh, much impressed by the way um, 1984 turned out or Brave New World turned out. He started writing his own book, Treatment of Criminals Through Aversion Therapy. So in this particular uh, book, there is this psychological experiment where Criminals were uh, forced to watch criminal activities while they were given electrical shocks. So by that, they were um, uh, the psychologists, the psychiatrists who were doing that kind of experiment was, were of the opinion that if we do this, the criminal will lose interest in all the criminal activities. Moving on to the very famous novel Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. It was published in 1932. Set in a futuristic society where technology, pleasure and social control dominate. So these were the three things that were of the utmost importance. One is technological advancement. Here it is genetic engineering. Although this genetic engineering part has not been emphasized but all, the idea is still there. Pleasure and social control dominate. Critiques that this, this novel critiques the potential consequences of a society driven by consumerism and mass production. Why is this genetic engineering uh, useful for the brave new world? Because they are producing babies in laboratories. Not, they are, babies are not born naturally. In this world, the babies are produced. Some babies are given the DNA of workers and some babies are given the DNA of the leaders. So according to that, the babies are produced and they are grouped right before their birth. Future world governed by the world state. This is the name of the government. This is the world state. 
The society values stability, pleasure and efficiency over individuality and emotions. Again, the very notions of dystopia that we were talking about a little earlier, all of these feature in this novel. Reproduction is controlled. See, uh, it is no more human beings who are giving birth to other human beings. Now, human beings are just donating their uh, ovum and they are fertilized outside the body and the children are produced, they are reared, they are reared like any other uh, animal in laboratories. Artificial means with babies grown in laboratories, citizens are conditioned from birth to accept their assigned roles and social conditioning. So right from the birth, the children are conditioned. Conditioned means it is a kind of psychological training of a person. Uh, you must have heard of classical conditioning and Pavlov's experiment. If not, you can just go to the Google. We have our favorite search engine. Pavlov's experiment. Pavlov was a biologist. He was studying uh, something completely different. He was not a psychologist, but he saw that every time he rang the bell, uh, his dog started salivating because the dog knew that every time my master's, uh, master rings the bell, I get food. So that is called psychological, that is called classical conditioning. If I am conditioned like that, then I will think in that way only. So the children who are grown in laboratories, they are made to think that biology is destiny. That is what they are made to think. That my biology, my body is created because I have a destiny already in store for me before my birth. My destiny is to be a factory worker. Society is divided into castes based on intelligence and abilities. So now the society here there is class distinction. Of course the higher class, the lower class. So what are the distinctions? Alphas are the ruling class. So the babies which are produced and uh, that they have the DNA of the alphas, they are the ruling class. While epsilons perform menial labor. There are other classes as well. There is beta, gamma, delta, all those things are there. Lots of classes and they have their specified jobs. Soma, a powerful drug is used to pacify the population and suppress discontent. So the workers, they are supposed to work from let's say 8 to 8, 12 hours shift or 10 to 8, uh, whatever, 10 hours shift. But the moment they are uh, out of the factory, they are given this drug, Soma. So they don't have any problem, they just take the drug and relax. So this is the uh, way the state is controlling the behavior of the people they, uh, which is living inside it. Let me tell you, it's a kind of criticism of our today's life because the moment we are working, we are working and the moment we are not working, we are going to the uh, cinema hall, we are going to the restaurant, we are playing games and every time we are doing that, we are giving money to the state. So whatever we are working for, we are spending that money right after we have left uh, work. So this is how the entire system works. It provides an escape from reality and promotes conformity. Once you are under drug, once you are conditioned, you do not have any kind of resistance to this kind of exploitation. The only thing is that I am fine, I feel relaxed. That gives you um, energy to wake up tomorrow and go to work. But your entire thinking process, critical thinking faculty, analytical behavior as human beings, everything is suspended. Pleasure and instant gratification are prioritized. Instant gratification like Soma. And let me tell you Soma is uh, derived from the Indian word Somrasa. I'm sure you know it is uh, uh, in the uh, prehistoric literature mentioned in the Vedas and Upanishads everywhere. Somras is the wine of heaven. So Soma is actually a kind of uh, satirical dent or a satirical hint towards this statement that 
religion in the opiate opiate of the masses this is something which marx let me be more specific karl marx has written in his book das kapital that when people have nothing to do they go and do religion which is i uh, let me tell you it is what karl marx said and uh, it, it is uh, not something we have to consider for ourselves it is an idea which many people follow relationships are casual and individual desires are subjected to societal needs there is no long running relationship there is no serious relationship they are all casuals individuality and critical thinking are discouraged to maintain stability the pursuit of happiness becomes synonymous with conformity the savage reservation this is the other part right before this we have seen the world state it is the power po uh, you know the power structure from where all the power flows this is what uh, suppresses everybody this is the government and this particular over here is the resistance to that government they also exist but they exist outside the territory they are not in this particular geographical boundary the savage reservation represents the remnants of the old world outside the world state the world that is the current situation that is the savage reservation john raised on this reservation serves as a contrast to the world's state citizens so there are characters contrasting each other if you go through the novel you will find it a fantastic read i urge you to go through it more now we will quickly go through another part of uh, another novel this one uh, was george orwell's 1984 the name of the novel is 1984 and it was published in 1949 the real name of george orwell is eric arthur blair and you will be very pleased to know that he was an english but was born in motihari bihar india he was born in india uh, to english parents because that time india was under the colonial rule of the british empire then he went to england along with his parents at a very small age and then uh, he lived there so 1984 was is set in a fictional totalitarian society of oceania ruled by the omnipresent figure of big brother there is a very popular statement in this novel big brother is watching you this is also a commentary on the surveillance system that was very recently given by jeremy bentham the name of the system that jeremy bentham gave was panopticon we uh, will discuss about the system of surveillance in the advanced course on science fiction studies no, uh, we will keep it for that time this is just for your information anyway so one of the most influential and thought provoking works in the science fiction and dystopian genre that is 1984 Oceania is one of the three super states perpetually at war with others the party inside oceania there is the party there is a only one party political party controls every aspect of people's lives using propaganda surveillance and thought control the party slogan is war is peace freedom is slavery ignorance is a strength so if you are in war that means you are in peace if you are under slavery if you are feel that you are enslaved by a system that is actually freedom and ignorance is strength if you don't know anything it is your strength so think about everything that you know around you this is just a lie that the oceania state government is trying to impose on the citizens The slogan exemplifies the party's manipulation of language to control the population's thoughts and beliefs. The thought police monitor and punish dissenting thoughts or thought crimes. So anybody who has thoughts of resisting this kind of oppressive behavior of the government, 
that person is reported to the government the thought police comes and arrests that person and tortures him new speak is a language designed to limit freedom of thought by removing words that express rebellious ideas so rebellious ideas like love rebellious ideas like resistance you cannot use these words that is why you have to use the word new uh, you have to use the language new speak you cannot use english as a language the main character winston smith is the protagonist an employee of the party's ministry of truth he secretly rebels against the party's control and seeks individuality and freedom so this particular government has a ministry of truth and they are trying to manipulate the facts julia winston's lover and fellow rebel against the party represents the human desire for love and intimacy in an oppressive society so julia is the lover of winston smith and she wants to have a deep, deep a real relationship room 101 a place of psychological torture where individual face their deepest fears the ultimate tool the party uses to break rebellious spirits finally truth and reality the manipulation of history and truth by the party this is something happening in our world also we don't know so much about the history of our own country and the history of the world whatever we know is through history books which are given to us which are actually sanctioned by the government what about the history that is not in the history books isn't there another version of any story that you have ever heard isn't there another perspective of any story that you have ever gone through there is but the only perspective you get is through history books so truth and reality these are completely different things but whatever we are presented with is completely different at times now we are going to talk about feminist dystopias there are the dystopias that we have already discussed and on the other hand there are feminist dystopias now what is the difference between dystopias and feminist dystopias of course feminist dystopia is a part of the entire dystopian universe you can already consider feminist dystopias only having a common theme common features especially related to women and non binary humans in all the dystopias that we have come up with or we have seen there are places where women are more suppressed more oppressed than men but in these dystopias their suppression and oppression gets the central um, stage their suppression their exploitation the amount of pain and suffering they are undergoing takes the center stage gender inequality and envision worlds where feminism plays a central role feminist dystopias of course they will have the feminist thoughts at its background patriarchy and oppression highlighting the subjugation of women in male dominated societies that is a very common thing reproductive rights addressing the control over women's bodies and reproductive choices a woman has reproductive choices she will decide when to have a child or not but suppose this is not the case suppose there is a society where the society decides whether it is right time for the woman to have a child female solidarity emphasizing the importance of sisterhood and collective resistance this is something not heard of unheard of before because in previous dystopias we are seeing resistance but female solidarity the a, a, a feeling of sisterhood among all the women in that society is something we have not heard in the previous dystopias female protagonists often lead the charge against oppressive regimes themes of empowerment defiance and resilience are very common let us take some examples so that uh, we may have a clearer picture about feminist dystopias the handmaid's tale 1985 written by margaret atwood if you are uh, not keen on reading the book you can go and just watch the 2017 web series of the same name it is largely based on handmade tale the story but it has an extended version 
extended story alongside it that how the handmaid fights back the system set in the republic of gilead again uh, the place is imaginary but it is, we are guessing that it is a part of the usa that have that have uh, proclaimed that have proclaimed that no longer a part of the united states of america and they are a part of gilead a totalitarian society where women are reduced to reproductive surrogates now this is not a, a situation of a family anymore women are actually made to produce babies on their own they are uh, just dehumanized and turned into uh, baby producing machines explore themes of reproductive oppression female agency and resistance the power by naomi alderman in uh, published in 2016 it's a very recent book imagines a world where women develop a power to produce electric shocks shifting gender dynamics reflects on the use and abuse of power and the implication of reversing gender roles one thing we have discussed this as a utopian uh, novel also but there is also a darker side but there is also a darker side to it that is what if i abuse the power i have as a woman character she realizes the she can give electric shocks to anybody one thing is to use the power for her safety another thing is to use the power to harm other human beings so that is the pros and cons of having power so one side it is utopia another side it is dystopia this brings me to a point i have um discussed many times in the previous lecture that there is a very thin line between utopia and dystopia vox by christina dalcher in a near future america women are limited to speaking only 100 words a day explores the silencing of women's voices and the importance of language and communication we in india have the right to the freedom of speech we can speak as much as i want i at least am delivering the lecture right in front of you i have spoken maybe 10000 20000 words right now in front of you what if there is a society where i'm not allowed to speak more than 100 words a day will i be able to convey all the ideas i have will i be able to help other human beings gain knowledge absolutely no the only thing i can do is reserve my word counts and the uh, the moment the word counts are over i will be shut silenced by the government so we are going to take this quiz think and answer what do you understand by the term dystopia i'm sure by now if you have if you have had the lecture if you have heard the lecture properly and if you haven't just go back to the first part of the lecture we have discussed the themes in details we have discussed it with examples we have talked about the uh, novel by aldous huxley we have talked about the novel by george orwell uh, brave new world and 1984 um, respectively you will find that there are ample examples of what a dystopia might look like what the society is name some science fiction dystopias of course you can take the name of let's say brave new world that is one of the science fiction dystopias and you can also take the name of an any other superhero novels or comics or uh, tv series that you have come across where the society is in a uh, chaos where people are trying to uh, gain as much as possible from uh, by exploiting other people what are the common characteristics and themes found in feminist dystopian literature this also we have discussed in details just go and have a look what role does science and technology play in dystopian worlds science and technology let me give you the example of the psychiatric treatment of criminals uh, that is aversion therapy which is practiced by doctors in uh, anthony burgess's novel a clockwork orange when you go and look at the development of science and medical science and technology you will see that it is not used for any good purpose it is only used for bad purpose you take 
the movie Age of Ultron. It is an Avengers movie where the AI is actually trying the uh, the civilization. The AI is trying to destroy the civilization. There are many other such themed movies like 2001 Space Odyssey where the computer HAL is trying to kill all the human beings in the spacecraft. The technology that we have developed throughout the ages has been weaponized and uh, of course that brings us to the debate of the nuclear wars that are most likely to happen in the upcoming hundred years. The nuclear weapons all the governments have if one of them launches one weapon, all the governments will be fighting or soon be engulfed in a nuclear warfare. What did we do with the nuclear power that we have harnessed from the uh, radioactive elements? What did we do with that? We did not use it to uh, force, we, we did not use it to power cities, we did not use it to power factories, we did not use it to power machines to help people get better. Uh, better quality of life. What we did was make bombs so that people may die. So this is what science and technology has given us when it comes to the negative part. How do dystopian novels serve as cautionary tales for real world societal issues? I would like if uh, it would be very much helpful if you go yourself browse through all the movies on science fiction themed uh, science fiction dystopias where there is a theme of cautionary tale that cautionary tale this particular phrase means that uh, a person is cautioned if you don't do this this is what the future is going to happen if you don't put a restriction on genetic engineering then there will be a time when babies will no longer take birth they will be bred in laboratories like viruses how does the portrayal of gender roles and relationships differ in dystopian societies compared to the real world? So is there any um, different kind of approach to gender roles in a dystopic society? Just go and have a look at uh, the, uh, the feminist dystopias that we were just discussing. For example, the power. Is the, aren't the roles reversed? So there are a lot of uh, issues like that addressed in the science fiction dystopias just you'll have to go and browse. Do you believe there are any aspects of real world society that could be considered dystopian? Why? In this lecture we have discussed a lot of examples which are very much related to the um, reality that we are living in. They are actually a manifestation of the dystopic literature that we have. People think that this is going to be this dystopia is not reality but that is not the fact. It is just a screen, it is there, but it is in disguise that literature presents the dystopic reality to us. Discuss Aldous Huxley's contribution to the world of dystopia. What are the aspects of dystopia in Orwell's 1984? Explain how reproduction becomes an instrument in establishing dystopic societies. So once you are able to answer all these questions, I am sure you will find that dystopia and utopia put together contributes to science fiction in a very big scale. Whenever you come across these ideas, you always try to refer to the classics like Orwell's 1984 or Huxley's Brave New World, you will find that these two novels have immensely influenced all the rest of the works that are uh, taking place nowadays. In order to learn more about these societies or these aspects of science fiction, you can take these books which are uh, mostly directed to dystopian literature. My favorite over here is Metamorphosis of Science Fiction on the Poetics and History of Literary Genre. You will find references to utopias and dystopias given by Darko Suvain. And my favorite, as always, I have mentioned is David Seed's book, Science Fiction, A Very Short Introduction. Once you go through this book, you will have a clearer idea of what we are traveling in or what we are, uh, what there is. You will have a very good idea of the environment that you are in when you are inside the science fiction universe. 
Thank you very much. I hope we, uh, the previous lecture and this lecture combined, you will have a greater knowledge of science fiction. See you in the next lecture.